Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. It really it means a lot to me. I really love seeing a full house like this. It's great. And I'd also like to give a big shout out to Canon um, mm -hmm. and thank them as well personally for bringing me all the way out here from California. It's great to be back in New York again. I've been here all of three months, <laughs> but I love it here. So, um, Why explore? Uh, the American conservationist Aldo Leopold, sort of, sort of known as the father of conservation, uh, once said that to people with an imagination, the most valuable parts of a map are where it is blank. And by that, he meant the wilderness. So maps typically are covered with all sorts of interesting things that tell us what's there what's supposed to be important to us. Maps point out cities, they point out features, uh, and what they do is they interpret a place just as much as an artist or a landscape photographer would do. They are, in, in essence, interpretations because decisions have to be made about what is important, what is there. But sometimes, especially for landscape photographers, the magic lies in between and that lies in those blank spaces. And I personally tend to be like a uh, cat finding a box. When I see a blank spot on the map, I want to go in there and find, find out what's in there. And that's essentially what this talk is all about. It's not only about how to go about the process of finding interesting places, about how to find these locations, but it's also about what else you might find out there that's actually inside of you. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is my own story, but firstly I'd like to discuss what I mean by exploration, broadly conceived. This is a video that I produced uh, about six months ago to let people know about an online forum for landscape photographers that I had started. And this might be what a lot of people have in mind when they think of exploration, right? You're going big, you're, out, you're going hard, you're up in the mountains, it's snowing, it's 4,000 feet up and six miles, which this was. <laughs> and sometimes it is this, sometimes it's exactly this, but it doesn't have to be. Actually, exploration can be something on a much, much more modest scale than this. And where it really begins is within you, because exploration really is a state of mind, in my opinion. And that's going to be the underlying foundation for everything that follows. My story is my way in to explain to you how I feel about exploration and its many outlets. Mine uh, involves the Dolomites to a great extent because that's probably where I've done the most of my exploration or at least that's where I kind of came into my own as a curious landscape photographer. This photo uh, is a more recent photo but I've been exploring the Dolomites for about a decade now. And back when I started, going into this region, that was when social media was in its absolute infancy. You couldn't just go online and find some great social uh, like picture sharing site and find all sorts of great photographs of a location and take it from there like you can today. In fact, it was quite difficult to find anything in, in the Alps at all, uh, let alone the Dolomites, because in the, that uh, period when I was first looking for this stuff, um, European landscape photographers were not only much, uh, there, were, there were fewer and further between, but they were also much less likely to be online in any of the places where um, the world kind of had access to what they were doing. So they didn't tend to be on the same sorts of sites that I knew about. There were local sites, for example, when I first moved to Slovenia, which I'll talk about a little bit later, the Slovenes had their own little um, site, that was some kind of forum actually, because the, the whole idea of a picture sharing site hadn't yet begun. So what I had to do was just sort of poke around uh, uh, with, without any other way to go about it, get out there on my feet, look around, get some maps and sort of figure it out. And what I discovered in that process um, was that I really, really enjoyed it. But it was really easy for me then because I had no external pressures. I had no frames of reference. I was just sort of out there just having fun. 
There was nothing out there that uh, I needed to necessarily accomplish or do at the time. I hadn't yet gone full time with my photography. Um, I was still actually working on my dissertation, uh, my PhD in, in art history. And so uh, this was just an escape for me. There was, there was absolutely no pressure whatsoever. I didn't have to worry about likes or any of that because there were no social media sites uh, to be concerned with. So I just went about doing what I wanted to do. And what I found, how I got into all this is rather complicated, but what I found when I got there was that there was this great feeling that I got when I was out there thinking through these ideas. And it's, the, it's that creative space that a lot of artists refer to as the zone. Now the zone is just that, that sort of that, that place of a sort of creative nirvana that you get into when everything else kind of melts away and you're left there with, with, with the space and your thoughts and what you're doing and everything just kind of flows. You're in that state of flow. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And it and, uh, sounds like from what we heard earlier on, a lot of you are landscape photographers and so I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't always happen, but when you get there, it's really a marvelous feeling. And it doesn't have to happen only in the mountains. Um, this can be anywhere. Um, I also have done a lot of exploring out in the desert. Uh, this is a shot of me um, out in uh, on the sand dunes called the Eureka Dunes in Death Valley National Park. And I owe this photograph to um, a workshop participant named John Skane. He took a very fine shot from a much higher dune <laughs> of me out exploring. I sometimes take students out exploring with me. Not always, but sometimes it's a fun thing to do. And it's, it's uh, also uh, a great experience for them to see how we all think through the process of exploring an area, like dunes, which are always sort of changing and um, need exploring regularly. The desert in general does. Nor does exploring um, involve something where you have to be alone. Um, so this is another workshop of mine where I brought people out in, uh, into a wilderness area. I'm a certified wilderness first responder, so I can do this sort of thing legally. <laughs> I can get permits to take people out into the wilderness, and we can, we can camp out there, and we can go exploring. And nor does exploring mean that you have to go do something wholly original that's never been done before, that is a complete departure from all that you know. In fact, I feel as though that's exactly the wrong way around, looking at anything creatively. It's not a good idea, in my view, to think about what you want to get away from. Uh, it's more so a, a good idea to look at, to think about what it is that you want to do and follow your own nose. Because the more that you concentrate on what you want to get away from, you're thinking in negative terms. You're still thinking in relation to that thing. Whether you are moving towards it or moving away from it, everything you do is still in relation to it. And so in order to get away from it, it's best to just sort of work through yourself and think through those issues that you have with what you're doing aesthetically, metaphorically, creatively. Um, and in terms of the whole, uh, whole package that comes along with being an artist, um, it needs to start from you. So this photo here uh, is a, another uh, photograph of me working with um, students. And this is a spot where uh, a lot of them request um, for me to take them because it's pretty fun. It's a spot where um, I took this photo. This is part of my juvenilia now, it's an older one already, but um, this is a, a really fun spot because the sun star rides down the edge of this mountain for about a half an hour, and it's a great place where everyone can learn to shoot sun stars. It's really fun. They have all this time to watch that thing if you get it at the right alignment at the right time of year. And, um, and it's a very rewarding uh, scene where you have all this light just washing through the scene, and um, the right time of year you get the flowers and everything, and, and, it's, and it's pretty marvelous. And the crepuscular rays are also quite common there. So it's very, very, very rewarding. But what invariably happens is people come out here and uh, they, they take this as a reference point, as a starting point, and then they explore from there. So they'll take that shot because they want to see how I worked through the decisions that I did. Why was my tripod where I, where I put it instead of 10 feet over there? Why was it at my camera at the height that it was and all the rest of it? But then they go exploring. They always do, and I don't have to tell them to do that. People just do that, and that's because if you get into a beautiful space like this, that's, that's naturally gonna come out of you, I think, when you're, you're in a space that kind of encourages it. But first, you have to put yourself in that space. So the zone is something that is really difficult to describe, but once you get into it, 
you s things start to flow and you start to develop ideas and it's sort of like working through these patterns that are running within yourself and and it's exciting you know you, you sometimes you may be working through something that's kind of easy sometimes it's a rather puzzling composition it can actually be rather challenging and you're still in that state of uh, complete um, oblivion being completely oblivious to the rest of the world and it's really a terrific terrific feeling now Good compositional sensibilities certainly help a lot but in exploring because you're going out into something that's, that's an unknown. But it's not a prerequisite. In fact, I think the two are inseparable. Exploration and developing composition go hand in hand because everyone ultimately has their own compositional sensibilities. If anyone here has ever been to my composition talk, which is a very uh, unorthodox talk about composition. Um, I explained about the personal um, trends in it and how composition is not necessarily an absolute content, constant. It changes throughout time. And I think it changes also for an individual and it's also kind of really personally relevant. And the way that you get to that point of having your own compositional sensibilities is through, I think, this process of exploration because you're exploring not only the territory, the terrain, but the terrain within. So that's what I did in the Dolomites. I scampered all over the place and I tried out all sorts of things because why not? <laughs> I was there and not only did I try a lot of things that didn't work out, I went to a lot of places where I found absolutely nothing and I came home with nothing in the bag. Um, but I had a great time out there and I learned a lot. I also did, however, find a lot of really cool stuff. And I found enough to keep me going. Uh, things that were really interesting, things that were as this is, in the, one of those completely blank spaces on the map where there's not supposed to be anything. And I found something really interesting to photograph. And sometimes there are these areas where you go out to and they're kind of these known, known spots and yet they're completely changeable. And no matter how many times you go out there, you have to start all over again. <laughs> the desert is like that. So you're constantly exploring them. And that, too, is a way of developing and honing your sensibilities. It's just rethinking a space that you thought you already had figured out. And then it changed. But there are certain constants. And I think it's very, very valuable. And what ultimately will happen through that entire process is you come out. And you get beyond the point where you're just making pretty pictures and there's something else happening. It's about not just composition, it's not about likes, it's not about producing something that people are even going to hang on, want to hang on their wall. It's about your own aesthetic sensibilities, about your own conceptual interests. And that ultimately comes out, I think, it will with anyone in a very powerful sense, and you'll know it when, when you get there. It's ultimately about discovering views that speak to you. Some of what I found when I was out there exploring the Dolomites was by virtue of going to the wrong area. Now, I didn't know I was going to the wrong area. For example, in this spot, uh, this is a fairly well-known massif. Even when I started going out there, it was the one that I had heard of and that I could really find some, some photos and books of. And back in the day, there were, I think, there were panoramio photos, but they were mostly hikers snapshots and um, that sort of thing. And so I had, a, I had some sense of what these peaks looked like, but I had no idea uh, that the shot was supposed to be about a two or three hour, no, good, through, yeah, three and a half hour hike <laughs> away from where this is, in complete opposite direction of where you can last leave a car. But I didn't know. I was just following my nose, going somewhere that I thought was kind of cool. And I came away with this shot. This is an earlier shot, one of the first that um, was really popular when I stopped shooting in the valleys. Um, and uh, it was because it was, com it was completely different for its day. Not only was it not in the right spot, but I had put some water in front of the, you know, I had found this alignment with this little seasonal stream. 
And um, it was pretty exciting to me, and, and it seemed like, to me, kind of an obvious thing to photograph. But for the people who knew the region, that was, I was going to the wrong place. And I actually had some Italians tell me, no, 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 you're not supposed to photograph there. <laughs> the spot is over there. <laughs> uh, but you know, I didn't know this. And, that, and that's what led me to find uh, views like this one, or like this one, uh, which you saw me photographing in an earlier slide. Again, just by finding places that look kind of interesting in between long periods of finding absolutely nothing. Um, but some of these places are really special, and not only really special, also completely uh, ephemeral. This particular spot, um, it, I, it has not looked like this for years. Someday maybe it will. It'll take a good strong winter to get these double waterfalls flowing again. But you just never know when you go out there what you might find. Most people could walk right through this spot and never see this because the waterfalls wouldn't be there. But I just happened to be exploring and I found them and I kept working them that, that whole month. I went back, and uh, I don't know, six times until I finally um, got some nice light um, to bring the little stream alive because there wasn't very much light getting down in here. I really wanted a moment where I could pick up some light down in here and, and, uh, and really get some life into the shot. And then I started bringing people because I went, uh, I went full time eventually with my photography and I wanted to share these places with other people and so I started taking workshops out here and that was really fun. There is an immensely rewarding feeling in sharing something that you've found with other people and watching them get the same kind of kick and thrill out of it. So I brought, started bringing people out there and we started exploring together. And then the following year, um, I started inviting um, some very high profile photographers to come out there with me, um, including one who was, at least back then, a, a fairly well-known photographer who um, had never been out there before. So I brought him, brought him around and he got a whole lot of uh, photographs in advance of our workshop and those went out there, so my workshops. Uh, his photos and then the workshop that we did together. Um, those all started to go out there and so we're talking years down the line now. The Dolomites, people kind of have a good sense of what they look like now, right? <laughs> and I'm not saying this is all because of me by any means, but you know, I, I certainly had my, had my role in it. So if some of these places now, this is again one of my older photographs, look familiar, well that's how it, that's how it happens, right? Somebody had to sort of stumble into that area at some point and start putting those photographs out there. And it is really tremendously rewarding. And when I first photographed this, this is actually the, at, at the, the Tre Chime Massif. This is the, the other mountain range to the south. And um, almost nobody was photographing it, and which is funny because it's, it's, I, I love it. I just love this sort of jagged, craggy, wicked look <laughs> into the mountains. Um, and so I, I took this telephoto photo and even some of the Italians had no idea where it was, <laughs> which is funny because it's sort of, it was right under their nose. Um, and a lot of them were just walking right past it. Um, but it's really fun to take people out here and for them to be, you know, it, when you see something telephoto, it's just a little slice of the land, and for them to see so much else and to see it in their own way and to see it just kind of go from there and now to look online and see this, these wonderful interpretations of this area, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's very, very gratifying. So, where do you begin with exploration? Because it can be daunting at first to think, well, I mean, I know there are all these great photos on Instagram and on Facebook, and I can go to those locations, and I have a pretty good sense of what you can do there, and, but how do you do something else? Or like, where do you even begin with that? And um, for me, it was, it was almost accidental. I stumbled into it, but not really. There was, there's a little bit more to it, and I hope that my story can help you to think about what you might want to do if you want to go in that direction. Um, it doesn't have to start with a location. You might begin with an aesthetic. Uh, when I was a child um, uh, living in California, when I was still in kindergarten, my family lived up in the mountains in San Bernardino, Mountain, San Bernardino Mountains. And we lived so high up there that we um, literally lived above the clouds a lot of the time. And uh, one day my kindergarten teacher contacted my mother very concerned because I had drawn a photograph uh, drawn a picture in class of our home with clouds beneath it and she thought this 
something wrong with your daughter. <laughs> you know, just, how do we explain to her that clouds go over the house? And so my mom said, no, no. <laughs> that is actually where we live. We're up in Running Springs. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, that, that I grew up with that. Um, that view, and that's just how I sort of thought of things. This is a, a, an early 19th century painting by Caspar David Friedrich. When later in life I started to study art history, um, I was exposed to these sorts of paintings and they really resonated with me. And it's always stuck with me, that feeling of how wonderful atmosphere is. Uh, it's something pretty special to me because I have a history with it. And so to me, that's something that um, I can really work with. It can help me get into the zone when I'm, when I'm in that kind of an environment. And so it's probably no coincidence um, that I ended up coming away with photographs like this. You can probably see the kind of conceptual jump between those sorts of images that I'd been exposed to through the likes of Caspar David Friedrich and what I ended up photographing. Now, I by no means was thinking of Caspar David Friedrich, what, you know, really consciously when I was out taking this photograph. Um, I was just out there um, just sort of looking and seeing and exploring. Uh, actually had found this place um, on a map very early on and uh, had always wanted to go visit, visit it, finally did. Uh, got up there and just started poking around. First instinct was to go up on top of this one mountain way up high. Uh, and go up to the summit because I thought I'd have a nice view across to that one. It was too high, didn't like it, and so I then just started going down lower and lower and lower until I got to this point, at which point my friend came along and asked, um, would you mind if I, if I got in the frame? So I'll go ahead. And when he got up there, I thought, oh, that actually looks really good. <laughs> I'll take a picture of him. I've got another version where I cloned him out because I kind of like them both, but my first idea was not to have him there. <laughs> But that's not even where my, my story really begins either. Um, I mean, it starts way back when, I think, when I was younger and living, living above the clouds. But um, there, there's also a, another uh, angle for all of it, and I'm going to share that with you as well. Um, when I uh, was studying art history, um, part of my uh, job was, was even while I was first studying, was to teach the undergraduates when I was in graduate school. And so I had to develop a, an archive of photographs for teaching and also for research um, that I could use to, to use in my dissertation and that I could um, show to the students in slideshows kind of like this. Um, but as, at, through the course of doing that, um, I got really into it. <laughs> like I really liked it. <laughs> and I just wanted to do that all the time, especially the outdoor photography, photographing the temples, that was really super cool. So I got all of these fantastic opportunities to photograph inside museums and inside archaeological parks when nobody else was there, when they were closed to the public and I had my run of the place. It, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty wonderful to um, hang out with the Elgin Marbles in the British Museum or um, with ancient Korai in the Acropolis Museum um, when nobody else is around you have the run of the place aside from a couple of guards. And I could go out there with my lights, with, um, with uh, tripods, which are normally not allowed for the public, and I could just get creative and have a good time. And the reason why uh, I kept doing this is I was being sent here on a assignment work at this point. I, because I got so into it, I got, got good enough at it that people wanted me to do it for them. And because I un understood the material, people knew that I knew what was important about the artworks and how best to show it off. So for example, one uh, sculpture that I had was of Alexander the Great. Um, one photograph I had was a sculpture of Alexander the Great. And most of the textbook images showed uh, this sculpture in the German fashion, which was straight, on the fr straight from the front. Um, from the side, from the other side, from the back. And it was, it's very scientific. Um, but I knew enough about the ancient world to know that that statue would have been on top of a base, at least five or seven feet tall, and his face would have been way up there. And the way that the ancient viewer would have experienced it would be to be looking up at that angle. And lo and behold, when you photograph that, that portrait from that angle, Alexander becomes a lion. And he was known for that. That was um, one of his um, sort of personas, was the Lion King. Um, unlike this sort of docile youth that you see in the photographs um, that are more scientific. So 
Having that kind of approach to anything changes the way that you see it, that changes the way that you think about it, and that changes the way that you photograph it. So as I said, I was uh, uh, also an archaeologist, and uh, I had to go out. I spent four years excavating in Israel. Uh, this is a site called Tel Dor. And that got me into um, outdoor photography, really. I was doing more of this sort of thing. And I learned a lot about light and what light does to the land. Uh, and I also learned a lot about exploring, because while I was out there, I, I explored all sorts of places uh, around that, that region. And Although it's complicated and I won't get into it, at some point in that, re that period, I ended up moving to Slovenia. And this was a very fateful decision. This was my view from the 12th uh, floor of what I called a people box. It was this, um, <laughs> it was this uh, Tito era building that was just as boring as could be. It was basically a big concrete box and I had this little tiny, what they called garçonniera. It was about a 300 square foot little, felt like a prison cell. <laughs> and that was my window though. I had this wonderful, wonderful window. And I was supposed to be in there doing all sorts of things, writing my dissertation. Now this is 14 years ago, okay, we're going way back. Um, and I'm, I was supposed to be doing all sorts of things except for, you know, gazing out the window. Well, I happened to have a little Canon A80 back then, and I love that camera. I bought that camera because I was told that you should have a camera that has manual controls. I didn't know what manual controls did. I had no idea why I would want that, but someone said I should have that, so I got it, and that's all I did was shoot in manual mode on <laughs> my little Canon A80. And I had more fun out this window. I went exploring through it without ever leaving this room for a very long time. And here are some of my, we're really talking about juvenilia here. So here are some of my views through the window from 14 years ago. Don't look too closely because <laughs> I'll be embarrassed. But the variety that I found out one window, I mixed it up with, with another point and shoot that I had, another Canon uh, super zoom thing. I've forgotten which model it was. but. Um, so I was able to photograph light changing on mountains, the, what winter did to the landscape, when the fog came in, looking straight down in the parking lot. You know, I had all of these options out there and, and hundreds and hundreds more. I had more fun with that window. But it was, it was my first real entree into exploration with outdoor photography, I think. That's what I really felt like I was doing there. I was exploring through that window. But it was just a matter of time before that wasn't good enough. I needed to get outside the heck with the dissertation, <laughs> or whatever it was I was supposed to be doing. And so I started down in the valleys. I started going around the rivers, which are very beautiful in Slovenia. And um, I traipsed all up and down the rivers. I didn't really know where I was going or what I was looking for. I was just out there looking around and having a good time. And I don't know if my mom's watching now, but she is. <laughs> and I took photos like this, sort of, eventually. This is really old. I don't think it's even in my portfolio anymore, but this is a, a, a lake in Slovenia, and I eventually decided that I really liked lakes. <laughs> uh, there were some that I really enjoyed because um, you could see underneath the water, and you could see uh, mountains in the background, and I just was so excited by that, uh, that dynamic that I went looking for that all over the place. I probably visited every little tarn in Slovenia that I could find, every little lake, um, and I really, I really had a great time with that. And then pretty soon I said, hmm, what happens if I go out in different you know, seasons? So I started exploring in autumn, and um, there I am um, taking a picture in a gorge. And I, again, started getting more and more curious about um, what else is there? How about I go up high? So I learned how to backpack. Uh, well, that's not really true. I had actually been into backpacking when I was in, uh, when I was much younger, in my teens, uh, but in the Sierras mostly and around California. And so European backpacking was a whole other thing. Uh, and so I learned how to backpack in the Alps, which really is, there's, there's a lot, there are differences. So um, I got into doing that and I, I went to all sorts of places all around the Alps, and I discovered what sorts of uh, different flowers grew where, and I learned what areas, at what elevations certain flowers were likely to grow, and I really started to get a feeling for the place, and I learned how I could extrapolate from one area to another, and I thought, bet if I go over there, because I know this is a similar kind of area, and it's about that elevation, I'll bet I'll find some lupin or something like that. 
Uh, and so I started to figure it out like that. And then, of course, I branched out into winter. So well, let's see what these places look like in winter. And I had a great time with winter and again decided eventually, well, I'm going to have to get some snowshoes and go, go high again because that was fun. Let's take it up high with uh, winter. And so I did that. And then I discovered, wow, winter is so cool. There are just all of these amazing variations on what winter can bring you in a mountain space. And so I had all of these it just magnificent. When you get all of the ice crystals in the air, you get this really cool um, kind of diffusion of that's, that's not just atmosphere. Sometimes you get um, you know, these, these columns of uh, rainbows. Um, I think they're called sun pillars. And just, uh, I saw so many amazing things. Wish I had better skills to photograph them back then, but I tried. Um, and I really got into it and discovered the zone. And that was when I really got around to that point where I realized what I was doing, what was happening, and that there was really no going back. I had found my calling, and that this was where I needed to, needed to head. And, and, I, and I committed, because the, the zone was just such a wonderful place to be. Um, like really ultimately just committed myself to just going wherever it would take to find my thrill, to find more of what I really craved. And at this point, I knew what it was. It was atmosphere. Now, Slovenia has all of this beauty, all of this wonderful uh, mountain terrain. And sometimes it gets atmosphere, but it's pretty rare. And the few times that I did see it, I thought, oh, yeah, I want more of that. Where can I find it? And I knew enough to know that the Dolomites was full of it and that that would probably be a pretty good place to go. And from there, I made this move out further, and I started going to Italy regularly. Every chance I got, I absconded to Italy. And I scampered all over there, too. And again, I, like I said earlier, there were no uh, pictures, really, to guide me. I had to just get a bunch of maps, and I did. I got boxes of them. I spent everything I had on Topo Maps, and I marked them all up. And using the, 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 the sort of the lessons that I had learned from exploring in Slovenia, well, I can, okay, that's where the tree line ends, and that's where I'm likely to find this. And, and if there's a lake there, then there might be some runoff somewhere. And I'd learned all these little lessons, and I just took all of that to, to the Dolomites and went scampering around all over the place just looking for interesting views. And sometimes it got a little hairy. <laughs> And what's interesting is that in all of this period, uh, some, some real changes happened with me. For one thing, I got really fit. <laughs> uh, I was doing a ton of hiking, and some of this is some very um, strenuous hiking, as a few people in the audience here who've been with me out there know. Um, yeah, it's, um, it can be a lot, a lot of hiking, and, and, and that's kind of stuff I was doing. I don't even take uh, people to do that all the time. But, um, what I also learned, though, is that um, in, in, these, in these areas that have these incredibly precipitous drops and cliffs, I wasn't afraid. I just wasn't afraid. And all my life, I'd had vertigo. And so somehow, some changes, the, the environment was doing something to me. You know, so we were kind of growing together, me and the environment, things were happening. I was learning more about myself, and the environment was changing me. It was getting in, into me. And so I was doing all of these crazy things that um, I never could have, I never thought I could have done before. So if you feel as though exploration is something that you can't do for one reason or another because you're stuck inside of a room or because you're, you have a fear of heights or because you're not physically fit enough, let me tell you, things can change. So the Dolomites have become sort of my, uh, sort of my stomping ground. And I've spent a lot of time there. And like I said, I did um, go through this long process of exploring, of seeing, and of experimenting, and of course, of finding. And I found all of these wonderful locations, none of which were already defined for me. I went there not knowing what I was going to find, and I had to figure them out. And for me, that was really fun. I loved that process of how do I take this? Where do I go from here to three miles from here? How might I make sense of this? How might it, I interpret this and make something that's meaningful to me? And I produced photos like this one. This one's going pretty far back now. Um, that didn't look like other photos. They didn't look like what was coming out of that region or had up to that point. 
and in that era, and that era, I mean, things can move very quickly. We're not even talking five, six years ago, I think, when I put that photo out. Um, and maybe not even that. And it, at that period, in that period, um, European landscape photographers were very traditional. And so this sort of thing was pretty wild. It wasn't really what people were doing. You know, I've got a focus stack here of, um, I don't know, five different focus points, and it's a, it's a vertorama, so it's actually a bunch of like uh, three or four um, horizontals stitched together, so click, 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 like this, plus a focus stack in the foreground. This, this was not, um, not common at all for, for European landscape photographers, so I was, I was just coming out of a, taking what I knew from West, uh, Pacific West Coast, uh, landscape photography, which was pretty progressive and contemporary back then, and I was just putting it together with this space that I had been exploring. And, uh, and of course I found atmosphere, found lots of that, <laughs> really, um, really lots of atmosphere, and I, I absolutely love the Dolomites for that. It's pretty predictable, and not only um, did, I, did I find it, but I learned how to predict it. Uh, there are certain um, patterns that happen, and you, you can tell when it's going to come, for the most part. And, uh, and I've gotten so good at knowing the little microclimates now that um, I can also make pretty good judgment calls about, uh, you know, if, if we're here and uh, something is happening in, with the weather that makes sense to me, and we've got four different options to go in, a, in different directions, a mile each way, I, I can pretty much tell which, which spot's going to be getting the love. Uh, and of course, I also uh, experimented with different seasons. I went out there in winter um, quite a bit. Winter is much more difficult in the Dolomites, so then I had to learn all about avalanche safety and uh, discovered actually that that really is kind of my Achilles heel, is that I have this terrible fear of avalanches. Um, but I, I tackled that too. So I learned all about how to safely um, traverse some of this terrain. I learned the hard way about terrain traps when I broke my ankle in one. And so uh, I eventually um, kind of conquered that one too. And this is uh, to, to bring it back to the, this is the opening photograph that I showed you all was me standing, um, taking this this photograph. And this area, by the way, is not terribly remote. It's right at the top of a, of a chairlift, basically, the hut. You can stay in a hut just about 60 feet away from this spot where I'm standing. And um, I didn't because it was closed at the time. Actually, I had to snowshoe an, an hour to get here. But um, uh, so, you know, some of these places, you know, exploration is not really all about going out where the polar bears are going to eat. It doesn't have to be that. But what I really, really came away with through all of this period was figuring out how to communicate what I found really special about an area. area. And that kind of goes beyond composition. It goes beyond just wanting to do something that's original or unique or any of that. It comes down to how you see things and how you interpret them. And my more current, uh, my more recent work has really gone into this expressive place where my photos are increasingly becoming about my engagement with these places, about my interpretations of them. And again, because I've sort of been trained in this mode of not catering to social media and not catering to, to likes or any of that, because I kind of brought up that, was brought myself up that way, I guess, but not to say I'm immune to it. You know, I do, I do recognize this, those needs, especially since I, you know, this is how I earn my living. Um, but I, you know, I'm able to go into these more um, dreamy spaces and and uh, and really bring out of an area what I'm feeling and and what I feel about it and how I want to interpret it. And that doesn't necessarily mean coming away with descriptive, literal, pretty pictures of them. In fact, some of them um, are quite quite moody and and I love them all the same you know they don't have to be something that anyone would want to hang on their wall in fact I feel that that should not necessarily be the end goal for photographs um, there's a very very big difference between the wall in a living room the wall in the bathroom and the wall in a museum uh, contemporary art is meant to inspire discourse in a lot of cases and that's what the museum is all about it's not necessarily a place where you go to look at things that are beautiful it's ideally a place where things make you think. So, sometimes the exploration of one area 
will lead you to explore another, as I just explained with my leap between Slovenia and uh, the Dolomites, it, it just kept going. And I have one last little chapter to that story. This is a, a lake in the Dolomites that I've been visiting for many years. I took this about three years ago, four years ago, something like that, um, at this uh, beautiful lake that was carved out by a glacier. And it still has that glacial color, really fantastic uh, color that it's, that's created by the sorts of soil uh, limestone that's left behind where the glacier left. So it has this milky cyan quality. It's a completely um, opaque lake. You cannot see down more than a, a half a foot in this lake. Um, and um, the thing that these sorts of places remind me of was when I first started exploring the Dolomites, there were actually some glaciers there. They were few and far between, but early on uh, I started going looking for them because they, they were interesting to me and discovering that they were going, going, gone. Uh, there are still a few around, sort of, if it's really generous to call them glaciers anymore. So uh, the Dolomites doesn't really have a whole lot of water at all uh, because it doesn't have that runoff coming from them. So as I had originally been craving atmosphere, I got to the point that I was craving glaciers. So I went where I could find glaciers, and that was the French Alps. So I just kept going west. <laughs> And I ultimately ended up in the French Alps where I found all kinds of glaciers. It is one of the most glaciated areas in all of Europe. It's pretty spectacular. They're all over the place. They too are disappearing, but they're still there. There are still a lot of them. And I had a lot of fun out there exploring, seeing, experimenting, dancing. If any of you follow me on Facebook, you may know the dancing video that came out of this. If you want to see me being completely ridiculous, you can go look that one up. And I started to develop ideas about glaciers. Um, I, I had looked at them long enough once I had been out there exploring for about five years um, that I started to have these ideas about them, about, uh, about their hold on the land, what they do. They move things around, their grip on it, the way that they touch the land. Um, and that started to come out in my photographs. And I went all around the French Alps looking for instances of glaciers with atmosphere <laughs> and putting those things together. But that wasn't all. I also really enjoyed the glacial runoff because I so missed the water of the Dolomites. And so I went to these areas where this, this is a cascade some, I think, 2,000 feet long. It's just many, many, many cascades of waterfalls. And it comes out with so much force that it's been carving this uh, groove down into the mountain for however long and it's just fantastic. You can see the mist from this thing about oh maybe two miles away as you're approaching you can see the mist coming off this waterfall. Um, this, this might not communicate the power of it so I went into um, a little closer view of it and I started to get a little bit more expressive with this thing um, and this is that same waterfall when the light's shining through it and it is just it's it's coming down from one side and kicking back off the other wall, and there's just this cacophony of, of water going everywhere. And with that light kind of powering through there, that really speaks to me. Um, and that, that idea of this, this, uh, the light coming through this really tumultuous space reminded me of what happens with atmosphere. And this, too, is in the French Alps, where you have this crazy, wild atmosphere, and yet the light can beam through it all. And to me, there's, there's a beautiful concept in that, and it's very appealing to me. So you might be thinking to yourself at this point, oh, well, it's easy for her to say. She's a full-time landscape photographer. She can just go exploring wherever she wants, right? Whenever she wants. She's got all the time in the world. <laughs> That's all she does. <laughs> I don't have time for that. i got to produce photos, you know? I can't just go running around and come back with nothing. She said most of the time she comes back with nothing. I need something. Well, that's true. <laughs> um, and there's actually another aspect to this. Um, Oh, the part about me having all the time in the world is not true. Okay, I do a lot of things. I give talks. And <laughs> but um, this brings me to this book. It's a great book. If you've never read it, read it. It's fantastic. The, the, the Art of Fear, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. Um, and one of the uh, issues that comes up in it, although it's not titled as such in the book, is the fear of results. That fear that we need to produce, that we need to come up with something, and it needs to be good. Uh, there's a really, really wonderful anecdote in this uh, book um, 
uh, in a chapter about fear uh, called Fears About Yourself Under Perfection, where um, the authors discuss this um, little experiment that someone did in a ceramics class where they took half of the class, the left half, the right half, let's say, and they said, okay, you are all going to make um, as many pots as you can and you'll be graded on quantity. And they took the other half of the class and they said, you all are going to be graded on quality and you're to produce a single pot. Now, which one do you think produced the most quality? It was actually the quantity side of things, okay? There's something to that because there is a great uh, 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 benefit to being a, uh, an artist who produces. You can't not produce, right? You have to keep producing. That's how you learn, that's how you get better. Well, uh, you'll just have to trust me that the exploration process enables you to have it all. And in fact, I think it gives you kind of a third option. Because in that, exper that experiment that they ran in the ceramics class, you had the one group that produced a whole lot, and they said that, according to the people running the experiment, that actually the quality was much higher than what was produced by the, the ones who were just shut down and so nervous, oh my gosh, just one? All I get is one? It had better be good, and they just couldn't produce, they just locked up. They couldn't, they couldn't produce the quality, they couldn't bring it. Well, it, when you're out exploring, um, you're not going to come up with that quality shot right away. You're just not. Um, this, this is uh, one of my favorite photographs that I produced uh, out in a very remote area of the Mojave Desert where I found some of the largest mud tiles I'd ever seen. The cracks on, on these, I could put my Canon 5D Mark III down inside the cracks. So each of these cracks is about that wide. They're huge. And these, these tiles are like this. Uh, so they're really big, and it was really, uh, really fun to shoot this, and, and, and it took me a long, long time to figure it out, to figure out this aesthetic. We're going pretty far back again here, before there were very many photos of mud tiles at all. When I first went out to this area, there were some, and they were mostly um, long leading lines, uh, straight lines, or, or some like kind of subtle curves, but I was really interested in these what, what first I had thought of is sort of like a horseshoe bend composition, like that, these round things. That's what I wanted to go finding. But I didn't get there, there immediately. I didn't go right to that idea. Oh no, I did all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and this is just a, a little sampling of things that I never seriously processed. I have never put out any of these photographs because I didn't deem any of them worthy. But I had abstracts, I had details, I had all sorts of things that I tried and I thought, eh, they're okay. I mean, you know. Probably 10 years ago, I would have been really, really happy with, with any one of those, but now they weren't quite speaking to me. And I have, I, have, I have hundreds of these, and they were all from about, oh, I don't know, two weeks, two or three weeks of time that I spent out there. I kept going back out. Um, but on one occasion, I was out there with uh, some friends, and we were camping. Uh, and we, um, we did a lot of hiking around, and I, was producing all of these, you know, ideas, these little vignettes of things. And I finally settled upon the fact that I really enjoyed the curves. I hadn't seen these curves in any photographs. I really wanted to work with that. And so um, I just scouted around. And one of these mornings when we had actually found, I found something that I thought was pretty OK. <laughs> I kind of liked it. And it was we were waiting for the moon to set, and there was um, uh, some ambient light coming up, and we were all in position. We we're all in get, getting ready to, to to just settle down and wait for the light and shoot. And I just went into explorer mode. I don't know what happened to me. A little flip, a little switch in my head went, "Bing, nope, not doing this." And I wandered away from them. And even though we had been exploring this area for a long time together, I somehow just gravitated towards this area, the, this blank spot that we hadn't yet gone into. And it wasn't more than I think five or 10 minutes from where they were. It was really, really close. And somehow we completely missed this enormous playa of mud tiles in which I found these perfect cracks that were absolutely pristine and beautiful. And I found this wonderful curving shape that I really, really liked. So I set up and I shot that thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> And I was just really wanted, the, I'd seen it that morning with the moon setting and it looked really good. And then that moment was gone. And then, you know, the next morning the moon's somewhere else, it's too high and it kept getting higher and higher. And I totally list, missed my opportunity. 
Um, and then I tried some other things. Like, oh, well, maybe I don't need the moon. I'll do some other stuff. And then I kept screwing it up. And at one point, I realized that I had knocked my camera and it had swung that way. And the whole time I was shooting, I was actually off to the left. And like everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I didn't get my photograph. So I came back. Um, oh, I, one part of the, <laughs> the story is one time we even, because it was so hard, because these were so dialed in, these compositions, it was so hard to make sure that we were right in position for sun for this uh, sunrise because I wanted to catch the moonset that um, uh, since we were way out in the middle of nowhere we all just left our tripods out there so that they would be in position and we just went back to camp and so we left thousands of dollars of tripods about a mile away from camp and then we just went back with the cameras and uh, so all we'd do in the morning was come back and put the camera on there and then that didn't work either I didn't get it that, that way either so I had to come back yet again and this is trundling down 40 miles of dirt road. And finally, things all kind of came together. And somehow, some way, I finally got my shot. And so this is not the sort of thing that, that I can say, oh, well, I got this because I went exploring and I went for quality. No, I did go for quantity. Believe me, I burned through all kinds of stuff. OK, and a lot of them were failed experiments. Some of them were OK. Maybe someday I'll look at some of that stuff and think, hey, that's not so bad. And I'll process and put it out. Probably not. but. <laughs> but so there is that kind of third option. So it's not necessarily just about um, you know quantity or quality. There's that working through and coming up with something that you really like and then really going for it. And it's kind of so it's all of those things. It's not an and or an or. So there is a lesson in all that I've just said that I would like to underscore. And I might title this from exploring to seeing, or I might call it three stones in a line. And this comes from my days of archaeology, when um, my, uh, my dissertation advisor, who was also the uh, director of the, uh, the excavations that I was on, used to say, um, well, if you have three stones in a line, that's a wall. And if you have two stones in a line, it's not a wall. Why? Two stones are always in a line. <laughs> so, and I think that this is how it works with with art making. You start to develop yourself. And you got to get enough of your stones in a line until you see those lines, those walls that kind of define you, that become the superstructure of you, of your creation, your creative output as an artist. So the foundation is one thing, but you need to have those kind of stones in a line. You just need to keep going out there and working them. So if you like mud tiles like I did, well, you keep working that theme until you've got enough of those in a line. And I did. I went all over the place. I found mud tiles wherever I could find them. This is out in Utah. Um, and here we are in an another area far away from any of those ones that I've, that I've shown you. And I found different ways to take these ideas that I had and produce something that doesn't look anything like the other photos. They're quite different. They're different takes. And, they, and to me, they speak to me in different ways. And they suggest different stories. Uh, and this is one of my most recent ones. When I put out this one, I thought, um, is, is everyone going to um, really say, OK, enough, Erin. Put down the mud tiles and step away slowly, <laughs> because I'd had so many of them. But you know, I really like them. And in each one speaks to me in a different way, as I said. And sometimes they're completely wild. They're completely unusual places. Um, this is deep into a, a river canyon where you can find them, and they're utterly unlike uh, anything else. And then, of course, they also uh, really got into abstracts. What else can mud tiles look like if not some kind of a, a grand landscape? Um, and I thought this one looked like snakeskin to me. And I have a, I, I, before I came up with this one, I, I, I probably have 300 abstracts of mud tiles. That I, a lot of them I really, really like. Uh, one of the other ones that I actually have released is this one, which I like very much, and that one also a completely different area from, from the one I just showed you before. So I really explored. I really pushed that idea. I really got into it. I put my stones in a line, and I just kept going because I just wanted to see what would come out the other end. And where it led me was all sorts of places. Um, you know, I, I found things that kind of look like mud tiles and work the same way but aren't. This is a salt flat, and working with salt flats got me working with other salt flats. And when you put them all together, it's kind of funny how you think that they're all leading you um, 
somewhere different, but really they all kind of touch on something that they all have in common and patterns start to emerge. And you realize that it's not at all about something superficial. It's not about something aesthetic. It's about something much, much deeper. And it's, it's about something that's meaningful to you. And so what I see in a lot of my recent work is this, this idea of these elements coming together and, uh, and that can play out in a lot of different ways. And so that's essentially what style is, and that's how it develops, I think, is through that process of exploration, you start to develop your own style. And it doesn't mean that it's something that's wholly original. It's just you. We all stand upon the shoulders of giants. Nothing that you have to do has to be a complete departure. Remember, that's moving away. What you do is you work through it until you find those things that you like, and that's enormously personally satisfying. All right, so now that I've gone through all the philosophical end of things and I've given you the background about why you might want to go out and do some exploring, what might be in it for you, <clears throat> let's get into some of the fun stuff, what to pack. So, uh, I guess I have to play this. So, um, there are a lot of different options, of course, when you go out to exploring. There are some different things that you're going to need depending on the sorts of places that you go to. And so let's just talk about some of these more remote areas because those are the ones that can be more tricky and that might involve some more of these fancy uh, items. <clears throat> and I will just touch on some of the things that I think are absolutely essential for that type of exploring. Uh, firstly, if you are going to go remote, I highly recommend that you have some kind of GPS spot device because these devices are what can save your life. Uh, if you're out anywhere where you don't have a signal with your phone, um, the spot device at least gives you a way to call for help. So I have this kind of uh, fancy one that also has maps and I can do, uh, I can send SMS messages with it and it connects to my phone um, and it is also requires a 15 month, uh, fifteen dollar a month subscription that I always have running um, so that no matter what I, I'm covered um, wherever I go I can always call for help. Uh, a compass is good to have if you are also if you're going out into these remote areas and everything else fails that probably won't. <laughs> so if your GPS dies and, and, your, um, and your phone dies and you have no other way of getting around, good old fashioned compass, if they're light, they're small these days, you can get a little plastic ones and they, they'll do fine. Uh, that's mine, uh, they're uh, sitting on my bathroom floor. Um, Canon M6, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, but this is my new must have item for exploring because it's so small and so so fun and it just enables me to keep the big kit tucked away for a while and this little tiny thing, it's adorable, it's so cute, <laughs> produces wonderful photographs, has the flip up screen and what I like to do a lot of the time is, is explore with my phone but the phone's a little bit limiting and the quality isn't that good. Um, but I do that some too, but to have this just opens up, mixes it up a lot. It has interchangeable lenses, so it gives me that option to kind of think through a space without having to commit with the big kit and sit down and think, all right, I'm, I'm going to work now. You know, it's, it's one of those things where it kind of lightens things up a little bit. Topographical maps, uh, I'll talk about those a little bit in a minute. Very helpful to have a paper one with you because, again, should all else fail, that might get you out of a bind too with the compass. Uh, smartphone, absolutely, and I'm going to go through a, a list of my favorite smart, smartphone apps in a minute, and I'll explain those to you, and a first aid kit. So many people don't carry one. You really ought to. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a big one. This is my small one. I also have a much bigger one that I carry when I'm, I'm teaching workshops. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it helps. It, it, even just a blister, if you're out hiking, um, can, can go really horribly wrong. Uh, if you're out um, a couple days out and you get a blister, it can actually be life-threatening. So it's good to have a first aid kit so that you can uh, take care of yourself. Now let's, let's talk about gear a little bit. Um, I personally um, these days prefer a Canon 5D Mark IV as my main camera because uh, it's hardy as can be. It can take all of this abuse. Uh, it, it, my, my Canon cameras, I've never had one fail on me ever. And I put them through a lot. <laughs> uh, they're excellent cameras. That's the Canon uh, 11 to 24 millimeter f4 lens, which is 
one of my favorite lenses. It's a big, heavy one, so if I'm out doing a long backpacking trip, I might back off of that one and take a lighter one, like the 16 to 35, but um, I really enjoy um, the variations that I can get out of these really wide angles. Um, I also really love my Canon 100 to 400. So I like going on the, the extremes, you know, the other way. And the great thing about uh, a lens that can go really long is that it's sort of like shooting through my window. You know, the world becomes just so um, varied when you have a telephoto lens. You can pick out all sorts of interesting areas. And in fact, you can use it like a telescope and look for places you might want to uh, walk to. Uh, and there's the little M6. And you can see how tiny it is in relation to the 5D Mark IV. So I really um, enjoy having that along with. Backpacks. Uh, this is a row of um, my students' backpacks on a recent um, workshop in the Dolomites. Uh, these are all f-stop backpacks because I recommend them. Um, they sponsor me and uh, so I um, can get everyone a discount and they, they all show up with them <laughs> in general. But they're great for exploration because what they do is give you uh, extra room to pack things, pack more than just your gear. And they're tough. They can handle the, the elements. And um, uh, they, they just work the way that I do, so I really enjoy those backpacks. What I do when I'm out on longer hikes is I take a, an expedition pack. Um, I have a whole lot of them, but this, this one here is an Osprey pack. And then I put an F-stop ICU inside of that for my camera gear and then whatever else I need uh, on top of that. So that's my F-stop ICU. This is one of my bigger ones. I have several of them. but. And it's also nice for traveling, uh, for air travel. You can just put all your gear in there, take it out of the backpack, and off you go. All right, so let's talk about apps. So some of the resources for researching some of these remote areas that I prefer would be these. Um, these are some of my favorites, and I'm going to go through some of them a, a little, in a little bit more detail than others. Let's start with maps, because that's pretty simple. Now, I said that when I was um, exploring the Dolomites, that's how I started. I did. I got a bunch of maps. Um, I marked them with these little flags. I circled stuff that I thought looked interesting, the huts that I could stay at. Um, camping is illegal, uh, open camping in the Dolomites, so you have to stay in the huts. So I would, uh, that, those were sort of my bases of operation. Those are my base camps, and I, and I started from there too. But I was looking for features that um, could get me started looking, uh, and then I could venture out from there. The, the uh, map scale that I prefer is 1 to 25,000 if you can get it. That's a really good scale for when you, where you can get a pretty good sense of what's going on with the terrain. Um, for example, this is um, a, a valley in the Dolomites. Um, that video that I showed earlier of me hiking in the snow, that's me coming up that valley. So I came up here, did these switchbacks here, and then along that ridge and where that was shot, it was somewhere right along here, uh, pretty up high, but you can see the lines on the topo maps, and now uh, I could spend a lot of time explaining how to use topo maps, but the basics that you need to know is that the contour lines, as they get closer together, that means it's steeper terrain, and going across the contour lines means you're either gaining or losing elevation, and going along the contour lines mean, means you're pretty much staying at more or less the same elevation. And the darker lines, at least on these maps, um, are 100 meters apart, and then you have 25 in between for the lighter lines. And so that's really enough to, to give you a really good sense for, um, once you get used to looking at maps, what you're, what you're up to, what you're up for here. If you're going to try to do this hike, you can get a sense for how long it is. For this one, it, you actually have to start. You can't even uh, drive to this hut. You have to start couple miles out so it's quite a long hike to there and then you got to go all the way up here and where I was going was way further here um, but let's have a look at this same valley on Google Earth so here's that hut that I was just showing you down there if you hike up the valley and the switchbacks I was showing you were like along here and I hiked along there and somewhere along there is uh, all along in here was where that video was shot uh, so Google Earth can really help to bring it alive for you, get a sense, not necessarily the exact shapes of the peaks, it's not that accurate, but it's close enough that you can get a sense for what, where you might want to stand, where you might be able to align certain things. Looking back down the valley, so here's back the other way. So here's the, uh, that second hut that was on there, first hut is down here, and where you park is way up there, so I was coming along here. And that's where all of that was, uh, that little video was filmed. 
And if you're down in the valley looking up, there's that uh, hut there at the bottom. Now we're looking back the other way. And here's a view um, of it that I photographed uh, within the last year. And that's what it actually looks like <laughs> from the valley down below. And I also have some other photographs from up high. So Google Earth can be very useful in combination with maps to really get a sense for where you're going, wh whether or not you can manage it, um, and what, what to expect when you get out there. But the next best thing uh, is Gaia GPS. As far as maps go, this is probably my number one recommendation for anyone, even if you're not going to explore far, very far at all. Even if you're just going a little ways out into the Mesquite Sand Dunes in Death Valley National Park, get Gaia. This is uh, really a fantastic resource. What it is, it's an app that enables you to download maps of your choice uh, offline so that then you can use them when you're anywhere that doesn't have a signal. So it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you remembered to get the maps in advance, you can then use them while you're um, out um, in these remote areas. So I've got this little video going along the side that shows me uh, scrolling through a bunch of saved maps and waypoints because you can save both of those things in this app and that's what makes it so valuable. You've got the map and then you can put the point and the point might be where you want to go or it might be something that you found so you can come back to it at another time. Some of these you'll see have photographs so if I find something I really like and it's a specific composition I might take a photograph of it and attach it to the waypoint um, uh, but other times it's just something maybe where I park my car or something so I can find my way back to that. Remember that recommendation. I know more than one person who has um, thanked me for that. <laughs> um, so it has a few very simple controls. So it has at the top these icons that enable you to expand the screen. It has this little navigation icon and then the saving icon and the layers icon. And so I'll explain what those do. Let's look at uh, the map sources, first of all. So that's the layers icon on the right hand side. These are the various maps that it has um, that you can download. So you have here uh, open landscape map, for example, that I've just clicked on there. Um, or you can go down and get maybe um, some satellite image. And then what you can do is select that area of that map that you want and download it. You don't get them all. You have to decide which layer you want, which map you want, and you download them in advance. But you can see there's just a huge variety of them, and you can, you can get more, but this is the stock that comes with it. And then what you do, once you've um, downloaded the layer that you want, you can then decide which part of the map you really need. And so you, you then select that, and you can call it whatever you want. You can have different maps within an area that are uh, small in size if necessary, if you need to save room on your phone, and you can delete them later, but you've got them there. So you only, you only want to take what you really need. So you don't want to load up your phone because these things can, be, um, can fill it up pretty quickly. But it's very, very handy in that regard. And then you go, so you go ahead and you, you just uh, download the map, you select the area that you want, give it a name, and you save it. Um, this is me scrolling through all my maps. So I happen to have a lot of space in my phone for this very reason. I make sure that I have a phone, not because I save a lot of pictures on it, because I want to be able to save tons of maps. And this, um, this is just me scrolling through some of the ones that I have. So I think they're, they're very, um, very useful to keep around. You never know when you're going to be back in a place and, you think, oh, I forgot to download that map, but I bet I've got it from the last time I was here. So waypoints. Uh, waypoints, you use the same little add button at the top, this one, to get the waypoints to come up. And what you can do is then place it with your finger on an area that looks interesting to you on the map so you can find it later. And when you get out there, you can have the app actually guide you to that waypoint. So even if it's a place you've never been before and you just think, well, I bet that would be really cool, the confluence of those two creeks, I want to go check that out, that might, <coughs> that might be interesting. You can put a little waypoint there and then when you're out hiking, the app can tell you how far away it is, you know, how much further you have to go to get there, um, and so forth. So here I am uh, going through uh, my waypoints and I've got a load of them in there. 
top secret information in there, by the way. All of my secret spots are <laughs> zooming past the screen here. <laughs> um, so I, I've been using this app for years, and you can see I've got a whole load of them stored. I didn't go through the whole list, <laughs> but there are a lot of them in there. Uh, and you can search for them. Uh, it'll, they'll always be there for you. So once you've got a waypoint that you want to find, what you do is you load it up. And I thought this would be fun for my hotel. So there I am in my hotel, and that's to the B&H Superstore. So what you do is you take this little uh, navigation icon and you keep tapping on it until it turns to uh, green. I, I forget what they call that, the context up or content up navigation mode or whatever it is, but it's the green one. And what you do is um, you align the red line with the green. So as that, the, that's turning with me turning the phone. And once you get the red line and the green navigation icon aligned, you just walk in that direction. And you just keep doing that. Now, you'll bump into a few buildings if you do that in New York. But that's OK. It's the same thing with like sand dunes. You know, you got to go around them. So there's all these things you have to go around. But you go around, and then you just find your next way to the O, oh, and you just keep following. And you work it out, right? <laughs> it's very easy. Uh, I really enjoy this for finding things. And it'll usually take me right to it. And it'll tell you as you're getting closer and closer how much further, 200 feet, you know, 30 feet, 10 feet. Oh, yeah, there it is. There's that really cool mud tile composition I like so much. OK, so that's the Guide Me feature uh, of Gaia. So Gaia GPS, I uh, really enjoy that app, and I get a lot out of it. So now, next level with maps would be, let's say you're going out into the desert where things kind of change a lot. Um, TerraServer is one of many of these online resources for getting satellite imagery. And why this differs from Google uh, Google's satellite imagery is that you have a larger variety of maps and they're all dated. Things change a lot in the desert. The desert is always out in flux. And so it's helpful if you can go out into an area um, knowing that what you're looking at is fairly recent, or you can look at the history of an area and see how it changes. So for example, looking for mud tiles, this is a good way to do it. Sometimes you'll go back on these maps, you're like, bingo, they do form there. <laughs> you can find a little spot. And by the way, the best way to find uh, mud tiles is look for any area where sandy sediments meet with runoff. Look for washes running into sandy sediments. Where you find those, you're probably going to find areas that sometimes create mud tiles. And if you want to check it, you can go back on Terra Server and just kind of go through the years and see if you can find them. Sometimes you can actually see the little tiles on the on the satellite images. So there are a lot of things in the southwest, too, where um, uh, water changes, washes, and it actually changes the shapes of things quite a bit. So it can be helpful to look at the maps and um, get some idea of uh, what might be out there or what it looked like last time a satellite took a picture of it. So that's, uh, that's the. Uh, maps area there. All right, photo pills. Now, I am not going to do a photo pills class today because photo pills is actually they have an academy they have a whole academy for, for this app okay this app is so robust uh, and so absolutely deep with features that you you really do need uh, a couple day course to really get the most out of it and they offer that uh, they have a lot of these um, photo pills camps that you can go to little two day courses they have a big camp um, on the island of Menorca that happens I think each summer and they want me to teach it one of those uh, next year, I think it is. Um, but it really does a lot. And it's especially useful for those of you who are taking interest in night sky photography. So it's very useful for that. Uh, so I won't get into everything. I just want to touch on one of the main strengths of apps like PhotoPills, which is just being able to get simple alignments worked out. So here I am looking at my phone and um, just changing the date of when I might be in a place. And what it will do is it will give you the alignment of the sun's setting point and rising point on a particular day. So I'm setting the date, I'm setting the time, and then it shows me the lines of where the sun is going to rise and where the sun is going to set, and also the moon rise and the moon set. You can get all of that there. And then you can just sort of look by pushing the time back and forth on the bottom there, see how the sun's going to travel and where it might hit certain features that interest you. So we can look at that a little bit more closely. 
Um, so and this is what ultimately um, you get with something like this. So uh, you get where the sun is going to rise in that direction, where the sun is going to set, and you can move the the little pointer around with your finger. Uh, oh, sorry, this is TPE, but it's the same idea as uh, what we just saw with photopills. TPE is actually where I began. I started using it before I started using photopills, so there's certain features that I go there only because they're just I just know it better, and 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 it's mostly. Um, not even necessarily any better than photopills, but increasingly I'm really appreciating photopills because of its depth, because there's so much in there, and I'm starting to move more towards just using it um, entirely, uh, solely. But you know, I'm a creature of habit, so sometimes I go back to TPE, which is also an excellent uh, app for these purposes. Noah, now once you get into um, figuring out where you're gonna go, the next question is, well, when do I go? And um, once you've decided the season and everything, well, you might wanna start keeping, uh, keeping an eye on the weather. And you can look ahead you know, only so far and get anything that's really reliable, and in some areas it's really a gamble, uh, no matter what the weather people say, but um, it, it's helpful to have some sense of what might be possible. So one of my favorite sites for finding out anything about the weather within the United States is, is, the, is NOAA. And the reason is, is because not only do you get what looks like kind of a standard forecast, you get, you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, all of that, and a little detailed forecast, and a little map about where you're talking about. But if you scroll further down the page, you get this very handy graph. To me, this is the beauty of NOAA, and this is this is so so often pretty accurate. Actually, I mean, not always, but I'm 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 really very impressed with it. So this is uh, me uh, looking through NOAA. You can go to the graphs, you can zoom in, and you can really have a nice look at by the hour how certain features of the weather are going to affect. Um, that environment and you can also go forward and backward uh, up to I think it's four or six days and you can get a really good sense for um, how a storm might be coming in and going out and when it might be coming in and going out how the winds might affect a location so this is what uh, that graph looks like as viewed on a web page and it's this area in the center that I think is really the most interesting uh, for me, it's the one that, that's the most useful. So you've got the blue line, which is your sky cover. Okay, so that's how much of the sky is going to be covered in clouds. Something that not everyone knows about uh, the way that uh, sun uh, set and sunrise color works is that what you really want above you is something like this, 99% cloud cover. And you might think, well, How's the sun gonna get through? The thing is, is that with the curvature of the Earth, what the sun needs to do is get through a hole in the clouds about 100 miles away from you, about the width of California. So ideally, you'll have total cloud cover over top of you and that hole about 100 miles away. So you look at those lines, like I showed you on both TPE and on photopills, and you look where that path of the sun is gonna be at the time that it's setting and rising, and then you go and look on a satellite map to see if there's likely to be a hole about 100 miles in that direction. That's just enough of the curvature of the Earth for the sun to get up underneath that wonderful deck of clouds, and that's how you get uh, you know, sky fire, if that's, that's your thing. <laughs> Not everybody's into, into skies, but if that's your jam, that's, that's how you can figure it out. Uh, another thing that's really useful about NOAA is that it gives you the wind and the gusts. So the lulls are down below the wind line and the gusts are up above. So if you're looking for, um, let's say this were in Death Valley and you wanted to go out on the dunes and shoot on a nice windy day, uh, this would be a pretty good time to do it. Up there with, with the wind really high. <coughs> Okay, Weather Underground is a great place to go for that satellite imagery to find. So you've so you've found out that um, you've got going to have a nice shelf of clouds above you. Let's say you want to figure out whether that whole 100 miles away is going to have um, uh, clouds, or whether there will be a hole 100 miles away. Well, find out what town might be near there. Plug that into some kind of app like Underground. This is one that I that I Weather Underground that I um, use. And you can um, 
not only find out from this app where the clouds are going to be, but how high they're going to be. And this is really important because if clouds in an area are low clouds, well, they're going to block everything. If they're high clouds, they could probably light up. Uh, it could be interesting either way. Sometimes, you know, just some diffuse low clouds can do some really remarkable things. So I, I would. I'm, I would say don't let it uh, deter you if you really want to go photograph an area, but it's helpful to know sometimes to make a call if you're not totally set on going to some place and you can change it up a little bit based on this information, sometimes it can be really helpful. So what, I've, what I'm looking at there is a satellite image uh, of, of this region, and then I change the minimum cloud height to something lower, and you see all this gray area comes in. The gray is the the lower clouds. So let's take a closer look at that. So here is um, another area in Switzerland, and there's the high clouds. If I tap on the satellite image, it'll bring up this bigger one, and that's where I can then go in and change the layers. And so this one, when I get to the end there, I've changed it to the low clouds, and I've got, um, got low clouds indeed. So that's what that told me there. Now, that's only um, some of that, especially NOAA, is only really good for the United States. And so here's a caveat to all of this, is that if you're going to any area outside of the United States, well, you need to find out what works there. For me, being in the Dolomites, uh, this, this site, RPOV, is my, my friend. Uh, but every region will have its really reliable source, the one that the locals use, and if you don't know where to start, I recommend just asking the locals. They'll tell you what's best. Uh, and it, it obviously it helps if you can read Italian if you're in Italy. <laughs> so, uh, they, they actually do have an English version of this site, and it's uh, sort of a, an abridged version. It doesn't have all of the information. So another thing you can do is just do a Google Translate on something like that if you don't read the language, and, and that works too. But uh, this will just stand in for all of the weather sites in the world uh, that might be relevant to wherever you might want to go. And then lastly, um, on the subject of weather, um, tides. Uh, because um, it's, you know, seascapes can vary a lot, just depending on what the tides are doing. And so it can be really helpful to have some kind of app. This is one I use. It's called Tide Track where you can get some sense for what the tides are going to be doing when you might want to go there. If you are going to an area that benefits from a low tide because it's going to expose certain features or get, enable you to get close to a sea stack or something, then you want to find out when the tide is going to be particularly low. So for example, anyone who's interested in going to the La Push area of Washington, you can find yourself a nice low tide at sunset. This is the day here. And that sunset, you can find a really low tide on January 30th. Uh, and so this is just me scrolling through a, a variety of days just to find where that low tide is going to be. And you can do this way in advance to figure out, it's amazing how predictable that is. Okay, so those are my go-to resources, and there are many, many more, and it really depends on what you are into. So if you are into seascapes, let's say, and you're really into shooting big waves, well, that's a whole other set of apps. Then you might want, there's another app called Windy that can tell you where the wind is coming from and how hard it's pushing, whether or not you're going to get some nice spray at the top of those waves. And the other apps that can tell you about the swell and how high it is and what to expect and when, you know, when to go out there to catch those big waves. And if you're into astrophotography, there are, there's just an endless uh, array of really fantastic apps that can help you um, nail that stuff down. But that could be a whole course in itself. So I'm not going to get into every single one of them, but there are a lot of them. And so long as you can command the ones that are really relevant to your interests, you'll be in good shape. So this all brings me back around to where I started at the beginning, which is that exploration really is a state of mind. And all that I have just said uh, can be taken to, um, to, to mean that, well, you know, there are certain requirements and it's better if you do this or that. And I'm not intending for any of this to be at all prescriptive. 
it doesn't mean, as I said, that you have to go anywhere that's very, very remote. You don't have to go very, very far. You don't have to be very athletic. You don't have to be alone or any of that. You know, you might be in an area that's actually fairly iconic. For example, this here is um, right near the area of the very famous Zabriskie Point in Death Valley National Park. Now there was a big parking lot there and a big walkway that leads, leads you out to this enormous paved plat uh, plateau where everyone lines up with their tripods to photograph, <laughs> to photograph sunrise at Zabriskie Point. It's very, very pretty, so why shouldn't they? Um, but you can go exploring just from there. If you just go a little ways on either side of, of that area, there are trails that head off onto these really interesting cliffs. And I have a bunch of favorite points all waypointed that I used Gaia. I, I went exploring one day, found them, dropped a bunch of these little waypoints, and then I started working those uh, vantage points. And now I take um, people there on, um, on workshops. I'm actually leading two of them for Canon. Um, coming up real soon and we're going to be going out there. But this is shot from not that far away from uh, maybe a 20 minute walk from where you park, 15 minute walk, something like that. So you don't have to go very, very far. And uh, I've had people up to 75 years old uh, come out there with me. So it's not, not something where you need to be really young or fit or any of that. Uh, and once you get out there, uh, you have all of these wonderful options, especially with telephoto lenses. So there you go exploring again. And now that your feet are done exploring, you get that big telephoto lens out and you can just go exploring with it. And when you're up on these ridges, especially at this spot, you have this enormous selection of directions to point and these wonderful colors and the, and the shapes. And it's just up to you to find the one that speaks to you, the one that really excites you. Me, I have this wonderful um, I have this uh, very intense sort of love affair with um, hierarchy <laughs> when I can find it. And I like it when I can find a whole bunch of lines that converge on something um, that really stands out from everything else. So having a big uh, white uh, butte there with all these lines kind of converging to it was really exciting to me. Uh, and and that was that's one of my favorite photos that I have of that area. But standing in exactly that spot, I also got this one. Um, which is quite a bit different. You know, it's still a Badlands area. I was probably turned in a different direction. A uh, nice day after a rain when the rain soaks all of those beautiful soils out there and gets those colors really vibrant. Uh, and just exactly the same spot, exactly the same spot as where I, I, I took that one. Or a shot like this. This is, uh, a, when I first put this photograph out, this is a beach in Southern Oregon. And this wasn't that long ago. This is a little bit exuberant for me, as you can tell. Most of my style is a lot more sublime and, and subdued. Um, but uh, this, this was a, an exuberant moment, so, <laughs> so there you are. Um, uh, but I, I was in this, this area and I was just poking around these beaches that were kind of close to where I was that nobody goes to. And in fact, when I put the photograph out, people said, where is that? What is that sea stack? This is the Oregon coast, where? Again, it's one of these things that was right under everyone's nose because it's a beach no one really went to because it, nobody thought of it as being particularly epic. It's where people go to walk their dogs. So you can drive right close to this. You can walk, it's a very easy walk down there. Uh, another thing that I did was I, I went exploring the tide pools, not really expecting to necessarily photograph sea anemones or anything like that. I just wanted to see well, what was out there. And it's not really easy. They're very slippery and it's kind of messy. Um, but I just was, I didn't even know why I was going out there. I was just following my own nose. And I ended up with this photograph of seagrass. <laughs> well, again, something not most people photograph. But it was so elegant uh, just to see the w way that that seagrass was curving around the rocks and then to have the, the sky kind of echoing that shape was exciting to me. And I found in this a whole lot of uh, aesthetic um, points that really interest me and that um, bring me back to other interests that I have in other areas. So, uh, so sometimes, you know, exploring is merely going where everyone else is just walking their dogs. Or it could mean getting out into an area and really pushing it. As I said, you get out into those areas where maybe, uh, I mean, this is, again, this is Death Valley National Park. It's the Mesquite Sand Dunes, but it's during a storm. It's during a sandstorm. Sorry? You are 
worried about your camera? No, I get that question a lot about my gear. Um, uh, actually, no, and I'll just tell you this right now that the. The, the sand will get into your camera, but if you have a good sealed camera, I, I've been out there with a bunch of my Canon cameras and a bunch of workshops too, and I've never had anyone have a camera die, as long as it's a real hardy sealed camera. Uh, what will happen is it might get a little bit gritty, but that sand will just grind up into dust and fall out. And my cameras are to this day soldiering on. So, I mean, uh, you know, Take, take all of that with a, with a bit of caution. <laughs> Eventually, I suppose someone will find a way to kill a camera out in these conditions, but I, I haven't done it so, so far. But out there in the dunes, um, I found atmosphere, right? So a lot of people photograph windy dunes, and they had before, I'd seen a lot of photographs actually of windy dunes before I'd gone out there, and what had interested other people, um, what you see most often are these very vibrant orangey red backlit fringy ridges everywhere and they're very kind of high contrast and they're very very uh, orange and, and extremely saturated and vibrant and that's that's exciting too and there are a lot of a lot of great examples of that aesthetic but I was more into that kind of impressionistic atmospheric um, aesthetic that, that I knew from the mountains and so this really appealed to me this moment um, and uh, uh, that photo actually has done really well for me. It's been a really popular one. But it's not the only aesthetic out there, and I have other interests. And that's the wonderful thing about exploring these areas and finding those stones. Like I said, you know, keep working an idea, keep exploring, keep pushing it. It's a totally different mentality from um, being results driven. It's saying, I'm going to go here, I'm going to get that one, that one's in the bag, I'm going to go there, I'm going to get that one, now that one's in the bag. That's location driven. But if you are driven by your own interests, and by pushing through these interests and the aesthetics and the concepts that come with them, you'll keep finding new ways to interpret a place that are utterly different from anything that you did before. Uh, so this is, um, I called this one Rhapsody in Blue. It was out one of these, uh, during these, one of these amazing um, storm uh, moments. And if you've ever seen storm clouds of this sort, they're this blue, green, they're utterly, utterly surreal. Um, it's incredible, and, and I've only seen them twice ever out in Death Valley, and I've been there a bunch. Uh, and this is one of those two times when they were this this blue. Uh, it's pretty spectacular, and if you get there during the blue hour like this, so now the sun is down and it's just blue. <laughs> and uh, I really, really enjoyed that. It reminded me of uh, many things that I know from elsewhere in the world, and I really connected to it. Um, but. There are, there, but wait, there's more. <laughs> you know, you can keep going with, with these ideas. So when I was out uh, in this area one, one uh, day by myself, I went out there during a windstorm thinking I was going to do more windy dunes shots, and suddenly the wind completely died down. I've told this story in another talk that other people, some of you may have heard, but long story short, there was this cloud inversion which is extremely rare for Death Valley. So the clouds literally lowered themselves down to, to, to first to this level, where it looked like they were just going to come down and kiss the dunes. And then they came all the way down, and I didn't really realize what had happened. And there, was a, there were total whiteout conditions. There was just fog all over the dunes. And thankfully, because of my little <laughs> locator line, I was able to find my car. That's the only way I could get back out of there that day, it's because I had um, pinpointed my car with a waypoint. And I just used that little line, and I just walked out in total whiteout conditions um, <laughs> to, to get back off the dunes. Otherwise, I don't think I would have known which direction uh, to go. But again, uh, it just being out there exploring, thinking through the ideas, um, I could have come away with absolutely nothing or something that was kind of repetitive or just rehashing my own photographs or not. And I, and, I, and I didn't. Sometimes I did. You know, so I have a lot. For every, for every shot I have that I really like, there are a lot, lots that I will never show anybody. And I mentioned before some of these areas that are very highly changeable. You can go and you think you know them, and then you go back and you don't. All of your waypoints, forget it. You've got to start over again. And so there's, there, I think it's good to have one of those in your back pocket everywhere. Just, just keep going back to it especially ones that change a lot because they keep you on your feet. You know something about them. You know, probably have some sense of the weather patterns. You have a sense of, some sense of what's possible out there. Um, you know what the background terrain might look like, but if the ground's changing a lot, it's, it's an exploration project all over again. You can kind of go out there and it's different. 
I, I, tr I use the word exploration separately from the word scouting because scouting to me is very results oriented. Scouting is I'm looking for something in particular or you know, I just want to find something. Whereas exploration is kind of letting the land speak to you. It's not like these are like, diehard uh, definitions of those terms. But that's just how I think about them. And I'm out exploring that as a state of mind. I'm out there asking the land to work with me. Another example, um, so deep in the heart of the rainforest, or maybe just a foot off the trail right near the nature center. You know, <laughs> it's just a matter of not having a really set idea of exactly where you're going to go, but maybe you do have a set idea of what you want. And in this case, I did. Uh, I had a friend who passed away at the age of 30 from melanoma because um, uh, he had gotten something in, in his neck and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And um, he uh, was my original landscape photography buddy. We had gone shooting together for a long time and it really hit me very hard. And the last day that I ever went shooting with him, a friend of mine took a photograph in a rainforest of vine maple trees with the sun star. And it really made me think about that day. And I had always wanted that aesthetic. Now I went to a totally different rainforest. That day when we were hiking together, that was in the Columbia River Gorge. And um, so the photograph was in a completely different state, completely different rainforest. And this is in the Ho up in Washington. But I had that aesthetic in mind. So it didn't matter where I was going. I was just looking for, I was just exploring and seeing. But I had, I had a lot of emotions and I wanted to create a companion piece. I think it was exactly two years after he had died or something like that. And so I, I really, I just needed to, uh, for closure, produce this photograph. And so I went out there and, um, and I tried for you know a few days to find something. And my the, my friend's shot had all these curvy vine maple vine uh, uh, branches. And I found this one that looked like spokes. And I thought it was really fun because it echoed the, the spokes of the sun star. And so I love the the echo composition. It's something I've, I've written about quite a lot. And so that was really exciting to me. And so that enabled me to wrap up all of these ideas and interests and the aesthetics. And I was just right off the trail near the, near the nature center there, visitor center there. Sometimes it does mean going remote, very, very remote. Um, this is uh, quite a ways out in the wilderness. Uh, this is where I'd shown that camp where I'd taken my workshop. And out here, there's, it's, I have all of these trees, like probably 30 trees waypointed, and they're all named. So I've got the dream catcher tree. That's a dream catcher tree from another angle. It looks exactly like concentric circles of a dream catcher, if anyone knows what an Indian dream catcher looks like. And there's like the Harry Potter tree, and there's the, I just, the, they're all in my, in my phone, all, all waypointed, and they're very photogenic trees. So I can take people to the trees, and I can say, that's a cool tree, and that's a cool tree, but I bet you can find another cool tree. There's a few of them out here. <laughs> so I uh, so kind of take people on the tree tour, and I give them some sense of what they might be looking for, and it's an aesthetic. So to, here are some ideas, and then people invariably just wander off and have so much fun. It's actually my biggest problem is getting them to come back. <laughs> so nobody gets lost. But I, you know, I make sure that everybody either stays with a nice sight of the rest of the group or else they have Gaia and they can <laughs> navigate back to camp. Um, but even though this is very, very remote and we have to camp out there to do this sort of thing, this is a night shot, by the way, that's the moon. Um, even though uh, we know we're way out there, you can drive to it. We drive right out there. So it, again, you don't have to be necessarily all that fit. You, know, you can drive way out there and the land's all flat. You can go walking around. You do need a tent or a big vehicle you can sleep in, but it's, it's quite fun and it doesn't have to be something that's necessarily grueling. Or here's another shot. Um, this one, I like this one because of the way that the tree seems to be like, whoa, look out, here comes the light. <laughs> and again, I love the atmosphere, and I really like the way that the, the, the interaction and the, the, the play of the characters in the scene. But this was not only shot where you can drive, but I'm literally standing in the middle of the road, okay, in a national park. I'm standing right because the road was, uh, there was no traffic. Uh, we had a few people just sort of got, get, out, get out there on the road, and we could see in a long, uh, see pretty far in every direction. It was safe enough, but we were able to get right there in position uh, and photograph some trees um, 
in the mist, which was wonderful. And it was through exploration that, that, that we came to this point. It was in a workshop, and we had tried something a little bit higher where the fog was gone. And we had no particular set place because we were just following the mist. So we were just exploring, driving around, looking for where does the mist end and where, it, how, how far does it go and what, what could we do? And we found all of these wonderful um, little scenes in there. Another example is um, out in Utah. Now this area, I showed you a photograph of this with some mud tiles that I had photographed years earlier. This is that same area. And so I had explored it years before, and I'd been back I don't know how many times. And again, I have dozens and dozens and dozens of photographs, some of which I like and I just haven't processed yet. But this area had appealed to me because when I'd gone there early on, uh, on this trip, not the same one as the earlier shot that I showed you, I had discovered that in this uh, soft light, the, the wow, did the soil colors really come out. If you can get that post-sunset or pre-dawn light, it's amazing how, my, how many colors are out there in those soils. And I really wanted, wanted a shot of that. And the one that I had, I figured, I'm not high, up high enough. I need to explore further. And so I finally got an opportunity to come back with my Photo Cascadia colleagues uh, in 2016. And uh, I just made a beeline for the heights. I just hiked way up there. And so it was that process of exploring, coming back, thinking about it some more, and knowing what I wanted in, in, in conceptual terms. And when I saw it, I got up there and I didn't even, I got up on the highest ridge and I walked about five feet and I saw that. And with that beautiful framing of the, the red V, it's like, yep, that's exactly what I was thinking about. And this this uh, sweeping view down off to the, that distant view, I knew I'd found what I wanted. So ultimately, exploration is really about finding the blank places on your own map, that sort of internal map that you want to explore, in addition to really going out to areas that maybe are not even marked on an actual paper map anywhere. And it's so rewarding to know that you're not going out there necessarily to find something. You're just going further than you've gone before. And that's really all that matters. You've taken what you know, and you're, and you're taking it further. Venturing into the unknown is always a gamble. You might come back with nothing at all. But it's enormously rewarding when you do find something that way. The rewards can be absolutely tremendous. When we go out, we may not find treasure immediately. Um, but at least we enter into a creative space that can help us to find ourselves. And to, to, uh, to top all of that off, I'd just like to put in a little plug for myself. <laughs> That I do lead workshops, uh, most of mine for 2018 are full now, but I have a couple of them left, and they happen to be in very uh, adventurous places. One is in the French Alps and one is in the Dolomites. I have a few spots left, and that's it for 2018. So if any of you are interested in joining me, I hope that you'll get in touch. And once again, thank you very much to Canon for bringing me out here. It's been a lot of fun.